Good afternoon, everybody. You're, you're all very welcome here today on what I think is um, a very interesting and topical topic. What is it, um, blockchain? What is it and how can it fix the internet? Um, you're all very welcome. I just ask you if you could turn off your mobiles, if that's okay, and to remind you that the, this session is on the record and the question and answers Chatham House rules apply. So I think we can see by all of you who've been here today that blockchain has caught the public's imagination. You know, it's been talked about, it's been written about, but it has also got a kind of wide range of people like scientists, technologists, policy makers, and even the taxman revenue are writing about it. And I figure when revenue starts writing about something, <laughs> the, the day has come. <laughs> so besides the European uh, Forum, uh, Observatory and Forums established in March, <coughs> and the Department of Finance have produced a discussion paper in March, which we'll be hearing about. And as I've said, revenue have produced a guideline which really is looking at the tax treatment of various transactions, particularly including um, the currencies uh, underpinning or being used, uh, who are using blockchain. So we really are at the stage now where if we see blockchain as a distributed ledger, ledger technology, that we have to also to ask the question, is it, it's not just about currencies, it's about other things and that the technology itself may be more valu valuable than what it has become associated with. In Ireland, there's a number of businesses using blockchain involved, uh, I know, up in the digital hub and other tech centres. So it, to, I think it is a really interesting topic and one where we are got, got a lot to learn, but where there's innovation and where we're seeing leadership in the area. And today we're particularly lucky to have two of the leaders in the area, um, Laurie Kyo and Maya Santa Maria. And both of them will be discussing it from a slightly different angle. Um, Laurie, I think, will tell us, um, and he means this in the best way, that he'll be doing Blockchain 101. And I think that's very <laughs> good for all of us. But um, Laurie is um, going to be the first speaker, and uh, he is the lead head in Consensus, which is recently set up in Ireland. It's a global blockchain solutions company. And prior to moving to Consensus, he was with Deloitte, where he headed up their lab um, in the, I think down the Grand Canal exactly. area. But he's also worked <coughs> as a consultant with Accenture. He lectures, uh, he's an adjunct professor in Trinity. I know he also taught in, in NCI. And his background is as a qualified financial analyst and stockbroker. But really what he's bringing to us today is both an understanding and a passion about blockchain, but also one who has seen its development and is involved in its production. So we look forward to hearing your presentation, Larry. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay, I'm going to actually kind of stand down here and probably run around a bit. It's my ADHD kind of kicking in. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you to Joyce, to Neil, and to Jill for organizing this and, and for having me. Um, I have to say one thing. So, I actually probably wouldn't be here if it was not for Joyce. So, she actually gave my first job in NCI uh, a, a few years ago. So, genuinely put me on a path that changed, I think, the structure of my career. So, many thank you for that. Uh, many thanks for that. So really what I want to do, very short time, so when we meet clients and governments for that matter to discuss blockchain technology, we can spend a day with them, we can spend two days, we can spend two weeks explaining what it is, how it works. I've got 20 minutes, so please bear that in mind with all the, I suppose, the level I'm pitching this at and also the questions you may have. I'm more than happy to answer your questions after, uh, also outside when we're done because the questions keep coming uh, and also through LinkedIn as the case may be. So that's probably point one. Point two, what I also like to do is I'd like to extend an invite to our, our launch. So Consensus is, uh, as Joyce mentioned, is just as recently set up here in Ireland and we have our launch party on the 11th of June. Why is this important? Well, to see me again, of course, 
But more importantly, <laughs> uh, more importantly, our founders is a guy called Joseph Lubin. So Joe Lubin was one of the eight people that founded the Ethereum blockchain. So that is the biggest blockchain in production in the world today. Um, it is also the most programmable. Um, and he's one of the founders of that. So he's also the CEO and founder of Consensus. He'll be speaking at that as well as the minister and lots of other cool people to, to kind of hobnob and chat with. So it's the 11th of June. If you would like an invite, please contact me, GDPR kicking in. So I could suck up all your invites, but that's probably not a good idea. And um, so if you do want an invite, please get in touch. We're more than happy to add you. You'll then get an invite immediately and we'd love to see you there. So it's a shameless plug for that aside. Okay, right. Like any good presenter, I'll stop presenting and show a video. <laughs> so, uh, so this is a video you may have seen. There was a documentary done. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. First step wrong. This is from BBC. It's a very short video, but it kind of explains things quite nicely. When you want to buy something normally, using your normal bank card, this is what happens. I give my card details to the shop. The shop asks the bank if I'm good for the money. The bank checks its records to see if I've got enough in my account. If I do, it lets the shop know. It updates its records to show the movement of money from my account to the shops. Oh, and it takes a little cut for its trouble. Now, if you wanted to remove the bank from that system, who else would you trust to keep those records and not alter them or, or cheat in any way? Well, I wouldn't trust you. I wouldn't trust you. In fact, I wouldn't trust any single person. But I might trust everyone. The idea is you don't have a central record of transactions. Instead, you distribute many, many copies of this ledger around the world. Each owner of each copy records every transaction. So, to buy something using cryptocurrency, I give the shop my details. The shop asks all the bookkeepers if I'm good for the money. The bookkeepers all check their records to see if I have enough. If I do, they tell the shop and then all update their records to show the movement of money. So there's no way that a forged transaction can make it in. If I try to alter a ledger, it won't match all of the other copies. And it gets rejected. Oh, and one of them, at random, will be given a reward of some newly created cryptocurrency. This is how cryptocurrencies work. And remember, all of these bookkeepers, all of these ledgers, they're not actually people. They're computers. Lots of computers. Okay, so that kind of hopefully breaks um, some bits around what the technology is. And the way to think about, I guess, blockchain and Bitcoin Blockchain is the technology which makes Bitcoin work. It's probably one of the most famous applications of the technology, if not the most famous. It's an important one, for sure. Uh, it's helped the world get a better understanding of what the technology is. But over the next couple kind of minutes, what we want to do is to explain about how the two perhaps separate. One is an application, and the other is a vehicle for many other thousands of other applications to be, to be built, to be made, to be created. And perhaps the next and yet best applications are still yet to come. That's a really, really important point about blockchain technology. So, blockchain 101, okay, okay, so really, what key things to consider. Blockchain is a relatively new technology. It is still evolving. It's an important thing. So it's been around, or Bitcoin's been around since 2009, fair enough, but in terms of general understanding, we're still learning. So we were speaking about this a few moments ago, financial services entities, due to perhaps the threat they felt about the technology were the first to act. So it's almost as if those guys dug up the road about the technology and then other industries are now learning about what it can do. So let's say supply chain would be a really interesting application of technology. How can you prove irrefutably from farm to fork the provenance of a piece of food as the case may be? And that can be applied to digital products as well. 
So due to the way blockchain technology works and its core characteristics, it lends itself as a great technology in terms of supply chain. And we'll come on to talk about that. And perhaps even its relevance for Ireland in the food sector for supply chain. And especially in light of the deal that we just had with China. So we'll come on to that. So finding, as guess, so new technology. Two, it's finding standards, right? And that's a really important point. Are there standards out there? They are forming. They're not there yet. So there isn't a clear rule set. What tends to happen when standards are formed is we see proliferation, mass adoption. So there's an international standards organization, TC307, or Technical Committee 307, which has been formed approximately, well, it's now, yeah, it's over a year ago. Um, and basically that group is forming standards all around terminology, around security, use cases, <coughs> identity, across a whole range of areas with the technology. And it's really important that they're doing this because it will result in adoption. Adoption at EU level or state or regional level. So this is a really important thing. And actually, uh, in, I think it's in May, this time next year, that group is meeting in Dublin in NCI, which is a really big deal for Ireland um, because we're on show and at an international level in terms of what we're doing with the technology in this space. And Mai will talk more about the, the Irish angle. Um, so I think that's really, really important. I think, what else would I say about technology? It's a technology that is, I guess, like cocktails, best uh, shared with friends, right? Or certainly not have your own. Well, debatable, I guess. Um, depends how good the cocktail is. But the, what I would say is, effectively, it's like a phone. You, it, the technology works when someone else picks up, and ideally when multiple people engage. So think of it as a, as a network technology or a shared technology or even a shared ledger. And at a very crude level, the way to think about it is, is if you have a ledger and I am buying or I'm interacting with you as the case may be, I'll record that transaction, you record that transaction. Okay, and that, that's great and that kind of happens today and it happens digitally. But let's say if I'm trading with multiple entities, like most businesses do, which is very interesting, okay? Well then, I record it, you record it, and everybody records it, and then we have to do reconciliations, and there's teams of people who do that reconciliations work, okay? Which, at times, may not be the most rewarding or high-value high work. So how do we create a shared ledger where everybody can see those transactions, much like the video we just saw, that everybody can see those transactions, validates those transactions simultaneously, and we all agree. So that, that reconciliation work disappears. It goes away, because we've already agreed. So how many thousands of people down the IFSC are working in the reconciliations game in the fund sector in Ireland? Is it 10,000? I'd probably say 15,000. So over the years to come, these jobs will be questioned by technology, blockchain being one of those, as to is there a better way to do this? And the answer is unquestionably, unquestionably. So I think it's a really crude way of looking at, at the blockchain technology. Um, what else would I say around the technology? Another key feature, I guess, looking at this, is it's immutable. Okay, and that's a really important point. Any interaction that you have on the blockchain is there and is there forever. Um, and that's a very powerful statement. So, garbage in, garbage out, yeah, that applies. It's not going to magically, if you enter bad data, it's not going to turn it around, cleanse it, and make it good. So, no, we're not there yet, although we're looking at it, for sure. But uh, it's there and there forever. So what that leads to is massive amounts of transparency on the information. So we're working with the government of, or with Dubai around smart cities. So Dubai, what they want to do is they want to change perhaps the perception of, uh, of their state, of their city, around public records. They want to have all public records using blockchain by 2020, and we're helping them do that. And um, so our project is live at the moment. You can read all about it. So that's a big part of it. Um, and we'll come on to talk about, I guess, when, when things are there and there forever, and we talk about GDPR and the right to be forgotten, uh, I don't have all the answers to those questions as to how that's going to work and play out. Um, lawyers are looking at that, policymakers are looking at that, and um, there are different rule sets developing in different jurisdictions, whether it be um, the sense that what, using blockchain technology is effectively, effectively about passwords. So if your data is contained on a blockchain, and I have a, a password and you have a password, if both those passwords are destroyed, the information remains, but no one has access to the information. And it's incredibly, it's incredibly, I guess, cryptographically secure, so it all becomes a string of random numbers that are absolutely meaningless to everybody else, unless you have the code which unlocks that string of numbers. So that's probably another thing. Another point there is decentralized, and this is at the heart of the Ethereum blockchain. The Bitcoin blockchain is very famous, as we, as we know, which facilitates the peer-to-peer -peer transfer of a monetary value which we've heard about, lots about over the last couple of years, including the massive increase in price and so forth. Um, but also, the Ethereum blockchain was developed, and was developed by eight, eight individuals. And what's interesting about that is they saw the Bitcoin blockchain and said, well, okay, this is kind of cool. We like the way we're able to exchange a monetary value, 
but it's quite limiting in terms of what the technology can and can't do and how easy it is to program upon it. So can we develop another blockchain which is easier to program upon, more accessible, open to everybody, and where endless applications can be built? And that was the genesis of Ethereum specifically. Open source, easy to use, so that can it become the next internet? And that's where you hear these words of people far more intelligent than I talking about the next internet being blockchain technology. Um, so Ethereum was born on that basis to be effectively the world computer, uh, a decentralized means for people to communicate. And we were chatting about this also a little earlier. So what, is it, what does it mean to be decentralized? There are different companies out there that say they're part of the sharing economy, okay? And they're interesting companies. They're very successful. The companies I use actually use one on the way here. So whether that be Uber or Airbnb, they say they're part of the sharing economy, okay? That's interesting. And they kind of are. But their data aggregators would be another way to look at it. They're an intermediary, uh, with connecting me to a taxi driver, as the case may be, and their platform takes a cut. So how do we think about it differently and go, well, how can I communicate directly with an individual on a peer-to-peer -peer basis to decentralize that system? So I get what I want, and that person gets almost, if not full value, in terms of the fare I'm willing to pay without going through that intermediary. Um, and that's exactly what blockchain technology can do. It threatens that model, whether that's Airbnb, whether that's Uber, but you can insert Swift into that. Um, and many, many other businesses that provide those services. And I, I'm not trying to pick on one by any means, I'm just trying to use them as examples. But maybe Western Union would be another. Western Union has been an amazing money service provider for many, many years, but also a very profitable one. So to transfer money, what is it, 8% perhaps of your, of your $100, or maybe there's a flat fee of $25 and it'll take three days? I live in 2018, I want my money, and if I want to send money, I want it to go now, and I want it to be nearly free. Uh, and if it's not, I'm going to find a way that it is, or go to that provider. So, that's the kind of challenge Western Union is under. And funnily enough, I've been talking about it for the last three years, and always wondering, why, why were they not doing stuff? And now they are looking at blockchain technology. Um, and maybe they always were, they just kept it quiet, or maybe they had their head under the duvet, because they knew it was coming. And um, you never quite know. Uh, but anyway, that is kind of... What blockchain is about is that peer-to-peer -peer play. How can I, as a consumer of your service, access that and pay you directly? Another example, perhaps, is, is songwriting or content creation. So if I'm a journalist or a songwriter, or if I'm a songwriter and I publish a song, um, I'll typically have to go through a label, there might be a distributor, and the, the, I guess the value chain is quite complex, and I may get some money many weeks or months later. But how can I create a song whereby if you listen to it, I get a micropayment for every second that you listen to it? And this is something which, personally, I'm really interested in. We have an amazing music base here in Ireland, amazing artists, and how can we work with one, and this, this conversation is going on, but if you have more ideas, very open to this, how can we work with them to create this solution, and have the first working version of that based out of Ireland? I think that would be phenomenally amazing. Why? Because it's not incredibly intricate finance. It's really easy to understand. You listen to the song, the money goes directly to the artist. And I can explain it so that my mom understands. And that for me is probably a good indication of a good application of the technology. Um, okay, what else we say? Smart contracts. Smart contracts are self-executing contracts when certain criteria are met. And effectively, what does that mean? So in the insurance game, a really good and easy to understand example is if you buy flight insurance or flight insurance or travel insurance, <coughs> your flight is delayed more than eight hours. You're due, uh, you're due to make a claim, so you've spent money, you've had a negative experience, and then the company says, go home, fill this form out. Um, so that you've had a bad experience, you pay for it, and they make you do homework. Sorry. It's kind of terrible. And then you may or may not actually do it because it is so terrible. And guess what? Part of their book, they bank on you not actually claiming it. Because they know you're lazy, because they made it hard. So it's interesting. So then smart contact, but well, what do they do? They'll link up to basically flight monitors so that one second past eight, uh, eight hours that your flight is delayed, that money will go directly into your bank account. That's a great product. That's a great service. Now I'm thinking, what other products or services does that insurance company provide? And you're into that halo effect. Do they, do they, are they, do they do mortgages? Do they do credit cards? What other cool products? Now I'm interested. And this is a big challenge to what's going on. So uh, Warren Buffett has invested actually in a blockchain company that's specifically looking at that solution. So he's a relatively successful guy, I'd argue. <laughs> uh, so cryptographically secure, every transaction that goes through is basically, there's a, a massive code generated. So think of it like a, a, pi a, a picture, a photograph, to which is made up of millions of pixels or thousands of pixels, as the case may be. If we basically put that, uh, that photo on a blockchain, a very unique code is generated. 
If you change one single pixel and then put that up on the blockchain, it will be a totally different code. It has to be the exact same. And if it doesn't match, the code is not the same. There's, it will not, there's, there's no match between the two entities. So that's how specific it is. Every single transaction that goes through, effectively it's a digital fingerprint of everything that happens. So from a governmental, uh, governmental perspective, that's gonna bring so much transparency as to who did what and when and why. So in years to come, as we, as we become older and look back at tribunals and investigations and so forth, um, hopefully things like this, there'll be a huge amount of transparency around this because it's, it's very hard to alter things. And if you try and alter things, there's a clear, uh, there's a clear backlog as to exactly who did what and when. So that ambiguity area just tends to go away. Maybe that's one of the reasons why the technology isn't taking off for some countries. Okay, blah, 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 okay, kind of looking at, uh, at pace going through some of this stuff. So reduced costs. So look, this is a really simple thing. A good example here is in terms of, let's say, correspondent banking or money transfer, which we explained already. Typically, why is it so expensive to move money from one part of the world to the other? Because it goes through lots of entities, from my bank to another bank to another bank to the local bank, as the case may be, and then maybe back all the way. All the time, as per the video, they take a slice, it takes a day, and that's, that's the explanation. So how do we do this on a peer-to-peer -peer basis, reducing the time, therefore it reduces the cost because there aren't as many people in the middle? It's as simple as that, folks. Um, reduces risk, okay, so there's no single point of failure. This is a really good point. So the way blockchain works is that there's no single owner or there's no centralized honeypot. So Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England, is very interested in the technology, and I do mean that very interested in technology due to this. There is no single point of failure. Um, so if I, I have a copy of the data set, my is a copy of the data set, Joyce is a copy of the data set. So if something happens to my data set, I, can, I know there's an immediate backup. Or, guess what, if we're all working together, everybody has that copy. So it produces that uh, built-in automated redundancy. Okay, so it's a really, really important point. Increases revenues, revenues new products. So we have, we're working uh, at the moment, obviously, with the European Commission which is a significant venture for us, for sure. We're, I suppose we're looking to explain and help explain what blockchain is to the European Commission, and to educate, to run events, to identify killer use cases for the European Commission, and then throughout the EU. What are the things that the EU can be doing with the technology? If this is half as big as the internet, we should be taking it very, very seriously. And this is what's starting to kind of kick in. Um, so new products and services, we're working with a range of companies uh, all around the world, uh, specifically uh, using the technology, more specifically with consensus, uh, using Ethereum. That's the, that is the, the platform that we use. Um, so with Ethereum, I guess, what's important to, oh, I'll come on to that later. Anyway, yeah, increased revenue, so new products. So based on the fact that we're able to go peer to peer, or we're able to disintermediate or disrupt, new products are generated, new products are created, new services are created. Other entities that aren't adding value are questioned, and maybe there's a line put through them. And that's life, and that's business. If you're not relevant, you're adding no value, why are you there? And I'm not trying to be dramatic about that, but that's what the, question, uh, that's what the technology, it, it's raising those questions. So improved speed and experience, we've kind of touched on that already. Okay, so this is a really good example, right? Um, so basically, the way, kind of, the way things work today uh, is to think about it like this. In a typical kind of database scenario, what we have are, in the middle here, is that we have a central administrator, and all these nodes, so to speak, would have read-only access to that information. And this central administrator, whether it's your company or, or whatever government as the case may be, this entity has read-write access. And then on a batch process, which can be run quite nightly, or it can be every couple of days, whatever the case may be, periodically <coughs> information is then pumped back out to these nodes, and then they come into work, or we come into work, and then we go, this is now the version of the truth based on the transactions which have been processed by the fund accountants and the IFSC, as the case may be. Okay? So we come into work, and we, uh, we now know that this is, this is the state of play. And we work, and we go about our work, and on it goes, and so on. Okay, that's kind of interesting. There's obviously a bottleneck with this entity, so what blockchain questions, and it raises the question is, well, why can't everybody talk to each other whenever they want? So all you do, is, you think about is, if we make everybody have read write access to that information set simultaneously, that throws, it puts that model on its head. It becomes antiquated. Then I get access to the information when I need it, in a much easier way, and now, more so than ever, we as consumers of digital technology, we're extremely ratty when we do not get access to information instantly. <coughs> instantly. So this is, this is what this model is about. Me? Re, sorry, so read-write, uh, access, and everyone's read-only. This model, everyone has read-write access simultaneously. 
Okay, there are different things, and this is where it's starting to get uh, kind of pushed on time. There are different ways. How does blockchain work? Very, very crudely, there's different consensus algorithms which make the technology work. So in the Bitcoin blockchain specifically, what you have is proof of work. And proof of work is effectively a mathematical puzzle. So every 10 minutes or so, a mathematical puzzle is sent out to all the different computers or nodes, as the case may be. Um, and that mathematical puzzle has to be solved. If you solve that puzzle, and it's like a race, everyone's trying to solve it. And the more computer power you have, the higher probability that you solve that problem. And that bunch of transactions that is recorded in that block basically gets added to the previous block. And one is, is linked to the other. And that's a really important point. One is linked to the other, and so it goes, and hence the name, blockchain. <coughs> so, that, at the moment you get rewarded with what? 12 and a half Bitcoin for solving each block. So at the moment it is a big boys game. In whatever, five years ago, seven years ago, eight years ago, um, we actually ha have a, a, a Bitcoin mining machine. It could be basically not, not much bigger than a computer, to be honest, uh, where you could have mined Bitcoin. Now what you need is this building floor to ceiling with servers whirring 24 seven to solve those problems. And that's what's happening um, in places like Iceland, in Norway, and in China, where they have access to cheap hydroelectric electricity. Um, because the power is cheap, they're able to keep everything going, cooler climates. Maybe Ireland should also go down that road, but anyway. <laughs> Not today. Not today. <laughs> so basically it's that mathematical puzzle. And then when, when they solve the puzzle, one block gets added to the previous block, and the miner gets a reward. So that's that term mining. So it is absolutely not individuals and hard hats, unfortunately. Uh, it is computers uh, basically whirring away and solving these puzzles. So proof of work is, is a very, I guess, energy intensive uh, way of going about creating blockchains, maintaining blockchains. So it actually is, what is it? It's 30 terawatts annually in terms of energy. That is not small. 30 terawatts of energy is consumed by doing this, and it's increasing over time. So there's questions that get raised, Lori, is it you know, eco-friendly? It's absolutely not, and I, and I can't argue otherwise. However, like most things in life, it's all relative. So if we look at uh, the likes of mining gold, that's 70, uh, or sorry, it's actually data centers are 70 terawatts an, uh, per year. Gold, I think, is something like 130 terawatts. And apologies if anyone's in the aviation game, that is 2,300 terawatts. So how bad it is Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining? Yeah, it's bad, but we should probably focus on the big ticket items that are 75x greater than, than, than Bitcoin, in my, in my opinion. Another thing that's helping solve that problem in terms of energy consumption is all around uh, proof of stake. So that's another consensus algorithm as to how, how do we as a group actually say these, are transa or these transactions are correct. And proof of stake effectively is the more ether is another cryptocurrency, and effectively it's you putting your stake in. So you'd say, it's, I will say, I, I'll put forward 100 of my ether that the following transactions are correct. If they prove to be fraud, if you're trying to commit fraud, and basically the rest of the network will go, that's incorrect, the stake that you put forward is lost. It's gone. So that proof of stake model is going to kick into the Ethereum platform around August, September timeframe, which is nowhere near as energy is intensive. And that is a definitely a game changer and one that smashes the kind of Bitcoin uh, area. Okay, so this is kind of Ethereum, so this comes to time, so it's going to skip on. Uh, skip on. We've kind of spoken about that already. Advantages of Ethereum, so why, why do I kind of keep banging on about Ethereum? Ethereum is the biggest open source blockchain platform out there, right? And from a technology perspective and a developer perspective, some hard cold facts around this. There are 30, 30, 30x times the amount of developers working on the Ethereum blockchain platform than any other on the planet. They're also the most talented technical people on the planet working on the platform. Why? Because it's open source. Why? Because tech talent attracts more tech talent, attracts more tech talent, and that's why it's really important that we have them here in Ireland. Because all you need is one, it's the power of one. One technical, absolute powerhouse will attract 50 other developers, because they want to be, it doesn't even matter what they're working on, they want to be beside them and learn how they do what they do. I've only learned there's an amazing company called Gilt that does online retailing, they probably have one of the best tech houses, or are one of the best tech houses in Ireland. It's an online retailing platform. Are they solving world hunger? No, but they like working together as a team. Anyway, uh, okay, so Ethereum, blah, blah, blah. Big other kind of things, the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, so there's over 500 companies and governments that are part of this that are helping drive standards in terms of interoperability between different blockchains to create standards. So it's also a very, very important point. 
There's also a, a whole array of applications that are built on top of it to make it easier to develop solutions and so forth. So whether that's Google Chrome linking into a blockchain through a solution that we've developed called MetaMask. That's probably another one. Anyway, so what are we up to in Dublin? So we made an announcement of um, 60 jobs, so which Joe Lubin will be talking about as well at, at our launch, which hopefully we'll see you there. Plug again. Uh, also, you know, speaking at MoneyConf, if anybody's going to that. But at the moment, we're a team of 12, very passionate people, uh, soon to be 15, and we've, we've got a 10-year lease on a building, so our commitment here is, is strong to Dublin. Um, and we are incredibly passionate about the opportunity that we have with this technology to make Ireland a powerhouse in this space, and I really do mean this. So consensus is, is going to be part of that story. It will not be the story. Um, we have a real opportunity here to get structured, get organized, and work on a whole range of cool projects across a range of different sectors and industries. Um, and we'd love to hear about it from, uh, from you guys and get involved. So what, what do we do at Consensus? Effectively, we're a technology company. That is what we do. We build technology solutions for our clients. Not on a time and materials basis. What we like to do is, we, if we see real benefit in projects, we would like an equity stake in that model. That's how we go to work. So that means it's in our interest that it works. The profile and background of a number of our individuals will be coming from a VC background, private equity background, uh, corporate venturing background, uh, or an M&A background. So it's people who have built businesses before, sold them, and so on and so on. So that is kind of, I guess, the background that we're going through. It's corporate venturing. And it's very much like a Jeff Bezos Amazon model, whereby we'll have, if we have 50 projects on the, uh, on the go at the moment, if one of those projects works, it, and one of them recently did work, uh, for a, a couple of hundred million level success, that then pays for all the projects that don't work, and it pays also for the next 50. So it is that definition of innovation. If you get one, it pays for all the other ones that don't work. And we go again, and we go again. So there's 50 at the moment. We're looking to set up our own project now in the next couple of months in Ireland, but our own spoke is what we call them, our own <coughs> innovative project that we're leading. So we also have a big training academy, so we're going to be running a training in September. It's going to be the thing that we're working on also with, with my government. We incubate companies, so that's going to be also happening in Ireland soon. We have developed lots of kind of infrastructural technology, so all about interoperability, how blockchains talk to each other, all around standards, which you discussed. And we also have our own venture fund. We have our own uh, 50 million venture fund, so we invest and we put our money where our mouth is. Um, I think it's a really important question. Um, that we get asked, do, do we use the technology? We absolutely do. Uh, we live and die by it. And, and it also got asked recently, what else do you do? This is all we do. <laughs> uh, this is all we do. Uh, okay, so uh, probably another stat about it. Uh, the consensus this time last year was 100 people. We're now 1,000 people. Uh, we're very close to being 1,000 people in over 30 countries. So every time I put this up, it's grossly out of date. Um, so blah, 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 lots of projects. I think the European Commission one is probably the most high profile one. There'll be a press release about uh, a consortium we're working with in the, in the trade finance space over the coming weeks, which is absolutely significant. Uh, other kind of fluff. Uh, interesting, maybe a couple, two ones that I'll call out here. Um, Viant is a solution that we developed around supply chain management. So this is something that we're bringing the team over from the US to meet with a number of companies in Ireland, whether that be Kerry, Glombia, Pfizer, etc., uh, all around provenance, uh, I guess, tracking from farm to fork of different products. And that's a really, really important one. There's also another cool one called Meridio. And Meridio are all about basically uh, tokenizing properties. There was an article in the New York Times about this a couple of weeks ago um, uh, about basically people like owning property, but it's not accessible to everybody. So how do you tokenize? And what I mean by tokenize, how do you effectively create, if one property is worth a million, how do you create one token that anybody can own or have more easily access or accessible to individuals to own a token in a building? So a building has actually been sold in Brooklyn based on this, and the team is coming over to, to Dublin to meet with a range of different companies and government entities to discuss this. Um, so if that's an area of interest, be more than happy to discuss it, but it's making it's making property, property accessible to lots of different, uh, I guess, entities. Our clients, we've kind of discussed this, blah, 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 and that is it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Laurie. We'll, we'll have questions after our next pre presentation by Maya Santa Maria, who's going to talk about virtual uh, currencies and blockchain technology. Maya. Maya is, is head of the financial advisory team within the shareholders and financial advisory division in the Department of Finance, which is really a new development in the last couple of months. 
She was responsible for ongoing research into the topics of financial services, but particularly looking at you know, consumers as well as the importance to this sector. She's worked extensively in the private sector for the last 20 years uh, in, in non-life insurance, in banking, um, and as a chartered accountant. So thank you very much. We look forward to your presentation. Thanks for having me. <coughs> Unfortunately, I'm not as tall as Laurie, so I might stand <laughs> here instead. <laughs> so you'll see me. Um, do I just move on? Is it for here? Yes. Um, okay. Um, I'm afraid um, the sexiest part of the uh, talk was given by Laurie. I'll do the, uh, the boring uh, government uh, regulation side. So uh, I'll try to uh, not put you out to sleep in the next 10 minutes. Um, I'm trying to think why, why would you be interested in hearing from me, right? Um, I'm just going to try to fi highlight what I think would be of interest to you um, in 10 minutes, the work we've done. And um, I think I'd like to have all of you going away with at least three points or three things that you'll be able to then go on and talk to, some, uh, to other people about. Um, one, I'd like you to, to get to understand with the SAPFAT or the um, Shareholding Financial Advisory uh, Division does in the Department of Finance. Second, I'd like you to definitely walk away with knowing what the working group on virtual currencies and uh, DLT or blockchain does. And uh, finally, um, get a feel for what policy making is and maybe isn't or what we're trying to do uh, within, within the working group. So if that's not what you want to hear, let me know now <laughs> before I continue on, right? Um, so um, um, as um, Joyce mentioned, um, I spent um, 20 years in uh, the private sector uh, in banking and, and insurance, and um, I joined the Department of Finance about a year ago. Technically, I'm actually not in part of the Department of Finance. I'm actually an NTMA employee. So for those of you who might or might not know, the SFAT division actually was created back in, I think, 2010, 2011. It was called the Shareholding Management Unit. And there were people coming in from corporate finance, from Davis, Dove Brokers, and so forth, to manage the uh, shareholding in the three belt up banks, right? So this was an expertise that the, uh, the minister didn't think was within the Department of Finance and clearly needed private sector experience to do. Um, why is it important? It's important because there is the team of 18 of us come in with private sector experience. We are seconded into the Department of Finance. It's a difficult um, balance to juggle on a day-to-day -day basis because we're not um, um, public service, um, public sector um, ourselves, and we have to find a way. Um, what I, um, I'm actually a translator by... By, prof by degree, that's what I did. I find myself using these translation skills quite a lot. Yeah, how do I translate what the public sector wants to public um, public sector speak? And it's a very important point because that's really a lot of the reasoning that was behind our intention when we created the discussion paper. <coughs> I'll come to that in a minute. Um, just quickly to to um, on the on the ASFAT team. Let me just quickly. Sorry, back, back, here. That's just a screen print. Um, you can go online, Department of Finance, org chart. You'll find these there. Um, I, this was totally new for me. I, I, Department of Finance, to me was Department of Finance. You know these guys that kind of do these things. Um, I was not aware of how varied and um, technical it can be. Um, you've got a very specific tax division, an economics division, funds and insurance markets. Uh, there's a very separate international finance, then you an international division, but it's not international finance. But they're very, they're very separate, and they have very, very specific mandates. Um, we are here on the side, shareholding plans advisory. As I said, the shareholding guys, the 14, 15 people, are the ones managing the uh, shareholding in the, in the banks. And the financial advisory is a couple of people. Um, and we've been doing this for a year. So, What's financial advisory? What are we trying to do? So when we joined the department a year ago, we, we were pretty much told to financial advisory for Department of Finance. So what does that mean? So we tried to figure out what does that mean with the minister at the time, which was uh, Michael Noonan. It was his idea. Um, the way I articulated what he wanted was um, he felt the department had been a little bit in a scrum for 10 years, right? Heads down, battling inch an inch, an inch of, of ground. 
And, um, and that's my hypothesis because I didn't have this specific dis uh, discussion with him. But um, uh, Mr. Noonan, being a, a monster man, I think he must have been thinking, I'm missing a number nine here. <laughs> the economy is trying to feel a little bit like gaining momentum. Uh, we might pick up the ball at some point in time, and where are we going? Uh, to, to Jill's point um, earlier on, this question of a lunch about strategy, I just got this impression of things are changing, but we've been so on our heads down looking at protecting the economy that where are we going to go once we pick up the ball? And I think that, um, honestly, from the interactions I did have, he's, the intention was how do we, when we pick up the ball, where are we going? So what we try to do is, is do that, look at risk and opportunities. So we try to, from a mixture of experience for all these years in financial services, from uh, research, from um, trailing all the headlines, you know, um, trying to see what's happening in other departments, uh, trying to see what um, other bodies, other organizations do and so forth. We research a piece, a topic, and then we try to figure out, okay, is this good or bad? Do we need to look at something or not? What's the possibility? What's the magnitude? And in this framework, I started to look at blockchain sometime late last year. So um, it was a fantastic day, the day I met Laurie, because um, up until that point in time, I was getting a complex for being uh, the crazy woman in the apartment talking about technolo technology that nobody cares about or wants to hear about it. So when I met Laurie and started talking about blockchain, I felt like a kindred spirit. Someone understands what I'm trying to say here. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was certainly was a, was a breath of fresh air. What I had um, ignored was this translation piece I'm telling you about, right? I was, yes, doing the research and the technology and all that kind of stuff, but I had failed to find the way to communicate that to the department mm -hmm. and to those divisions. So what we tried to do is, well, let's do research piece. Let's see it with fresh eyes like we did a few months ago, and let's just present this to the, to the department, to the sec gen, to the minister, and see if they agree with us. And what we were presenting was the fact that what we could see was that technology, this technology particularly, was impacting so many different divisions across the department and the economy that we had to find somehow a unifying glue. What is a threat to create some cohesion and drive it forward? And that's what we tried to do. Um, sorry, keep going backwards. Um, on March 22nd, the Minister um, issued a press release saying that he was creating a working group and um, he published this discussion paper. I just want to highlight this. This is just, a, um, it's just a extracts from his press release, which are online. You just Google up uh, Department of Finance discussion paper. This comes up and there's a link to it, the discussion paper. Has anyone here read the discussion paper by any chance? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you have? Well, that's great. Um, I'd encourage you to take it, drink it over coffee. It's very vanilla. It really is like your your blockchain was one on one. I think ours is minus a hundred. Uh, <laughs> it's as as high level as it can possibly be. The intention being this, right? We felt let's just translate what we're trying to do. All this technology speak in a way that people can relate to it, and once they can relate to it, they can start to figure out and discuss and try to go, oh, is this really a risk? Uh, how does this affect what we're looking at? Say for the tax guys, how do I take that and I, and I make it mine? Uh, securities guys, how does it impact what I'm doing with the uh, EU securities law and so forth? So as I said, it's online, it's stale, I'm telling you now already, um, this was written in January. Uh, yes, <laughs> it is stale, isn't it, Stephen? Um, technology has moved so fast. Um, we mostly talk a lot uh, about Bitcoin and explaining mining. Again, why? Because you've all heard of Bitcoin. You've all heard the le uh, seen the headlines, right? It's the entry way to, to blockchain and the technology. It's a, it's a way of um, certainly grabbing your attention. And uh, for the people in the Department of Finance talking about cryptocurrency, the word cryptocurrency and monetary, po monetary policy, this was something that definitely brought them in to, um, to come and discuss with us. Now, the intention of the working group, um, when we presented the idea of creating the working group was because we felt there was a gap. Um, yeah, to Jill's point earlier, it still feels there is a gap in terms of strategy. Yeah, but we have to start somewhere, right? Um, what's the stance? Do we love this thing or do we hate it? Do we understand it? 
do we like a little bit of it? Do we like the, the currency side of it? Do we like the technology bit? Do we like it for a garment only? Do we, what do we do from a growth perspective in terms of um, companies? What do we do with it? So um, thinking of the Department of Finance um, mandates, certainly we thought that thinking at consumers, for example, there was a lot of misconception. There's a lot of misunderstanding. And to start off, there were some very quick wins, something quick that we could do definitely to at least straight away provide transparency for investors and for consumers. Uh, the CPI, um, Scott, you can uh, if, correct me if I'm getting wrong, is December 2017 and early February, I think, 28, uh, 2018, the CPI issued two separate um, warnings. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, the first one, I think, was actually around um, um, I, the first one actually was on virtual currencies, and the one in February was actually an ICO specific, which is very good. It's great, it's out there. Um, at the end of the day, it's like, if you're a student in Trinity walking down the street and you've decided to invest some money in Bitcoin, are you gonna go to check the CBI website if there's a warning against that? Maybe not. So um, when we said about transparency, we probably wanted maybe to popularize that, um, you know, make those warnings a bit more um, um, open to consumers and investors. We also felt that, yes, that's great, the Department of Finance is wide, we have all these divisions, everybody's doing their thing, like, I mean, someone mentioned of, over, of a lunch as well, our way of working is quite siloed. So how can we weave a thread to all of those and make sure that as things happened, that we all look for the same points, provide the same feedback, we gather the same um, interesting information bits that we need to be home and bring ourselves. So how do we monitor developments globally, internationally, at EU level, OECD level, in Ireland, and so forth. And um, the last point um, the working group is trying to do, certainly, is to come up with some suitable policy responses. Um, the word being suitable, uh, it doesn't mean increased regulation, I th and I'll come to that um, a little bit after that. I think the most important point, and I like to quote the, the European Commission on this, is that regulation should not um, be biased toward traditional forms of business. So how do we make sure that current regulation is not actually working against um, new technology, okay? So I did warn you that this was the boring bit, guys. Um, so working group, that's what we're trying to do. now. The working group has been in, in existence now for two months. Um, what we do is we meet on a monthly basis. We have uh, representatives, key people from each one of the divisions. So we have tax, we have banking, we have payments, we have securities, we have consumer protection, and now we're going to have economics as well. Yeah, we all meet together. The intention is certainly to move, uh, sorry, to meet internally in the department but to also build the bridges of going outside. It is absolutely impossible that a Department of Finance, or any government depart um, department for that matter, can come up with a policy idea, if needed, without engagement from a, from a sector and professional bodies. It's just impossible, especially for something so new. And uh, that's something we've been very upfront from the start, and with that working group has to have the mandate to open the door and literally be that portal and um, it's, it's part of the ecosystem. You cannot possibly do that unless, um, unless all the parts of the ecosystem are, are working together. So ecosystem, what does that mean? So when we started looking at blockchain, we didn't really know how to or who to go to. We knew a couple of people. Um, we've tried to start having a feel for what does it mean? What does the ecosystem in Ireland mean? Um, we have a couple of use cases, a couple of companies that are actually ready utilizing uh, blockchain to very good use, and we reference one of them in discussion paper, that's um, Moe Coffee, for example, right? Traceable coffee, you know? Uh, this uh, crowd that effectively have decided to use uh, blockchain to improve uh, food traceability. It's used, it's there, you can actually buy the coffee today. Um, until we started looking at it, we probably wouldn't have thought about it twice. So, this is just a quick idea. I don't know how many names you recognize up there. I mean, people can read. Mm. These are people, uh, whether it be, um, so any wallet, we have ticketing, we've got, you know, ATEC is there. Did you realize that we have three virtual currencies in Ireland? Like somebody in Ireland actually gone and actually, um, you know, issued a virtual currency. So these are our first attempts to try to 
to get a feel for who do we have to involve, who do we have to speak to, how do we all get around the table and have a discussion about how we help each other. So, I said I wanted to present the ESFAT team to you, explain to you what the work group does. So, I'll give one minute about some of the things we've done in the work group. Um, I already mentioned we've been existing for two months, that we have um, been meeting regularly. We have started engagement with the um, private sector and uh, professional bodies. Um, not as fast as we want to, we want it to go a lot faster than that, but I'm hoping that um, this is part of this, right? Not a many people also know that the working group is created, so like this specifically working in, in blockchain. Um, we have had done some things. Um, we did, um, some of you may be aware of, um, of parliamentary questions, you know? Some people would have a question, put in a, a PQ. Well, somebody put in a PQ to government back in 2013 about Bitcoin. 2013, that's pretty impressive, right? Mm -hmm. There's been um, up to, I think it's eight now, PQs since then. They're actually, an appendix of them are at the back of, a, of our discussion paper. They're there, they're, they're Googleable if you want to look at them. Back in 2014, Revenue said that we're going to issue guidelines on the tax treatment of virtual currencies. And four years later, we were still waiting for them. Yeah, that was the PQ race in 2014. So. Part of what the working group wanted to do was to really say, well, we're here now, you need to engage, we need to do something, we want to provide transparency um, to investors and to, to, um, and to taxpayers, please give us something. So, uh, 18th, of, um, 18th of May, that's right, Revenue um, issued an e-brief. Delighted, very good. Doesn't cover ICOs, but it's more than we had four years ago. It's more than we had a month ago, right? That's, that's, that's progress. Very happy <laughs> myself, but it might be not so interesting for you guys. Other things we've done, um, Department of Finance um, website now has a landing page. What's a landing page? Well, again, you know, people coming to Ireland, what are we doing in the blockchain space? Who's doing what? Um, well, again, we're just trying to, it's, a landing page means a page that is easier to kind of, um, to, to, to access. Again, if I go back to my um, analogy about the Trinity student checking the, uh, the warning on the CPI page, I don't think the Trinity student were going to go and check what the Department of Finance tells me about X, Y, and Z, but we do have something. Yeah, so now we have a page in the Department of Finance that says this is the working group, this is what we're trying to do. And by the way, these are things that are relevant to you. <coughs> CCPC have issued a consumer warning of investing in uh, cryptocurrencies and, um, and ICOs. So there's a link there. Uh, guidance on VAT, there's a link there. Um, CBI warnings, there's a link there. The intention is to at least have one place for now for all those regulatory um, um, pronouncements easily accessible. Um, other things we've done as well, we have ramped up the presence and the representation of Ireland at European level and global level. And I think that's probably of particular interest to you. So one of the gaps that we highlighted or we've discovered while doing the research was the European Union is doing things, the European Commission is particularly is doing lots of things. Um, you, the OECD had started to look at, you may or may not know that back at the um, uh, G20 in, um, in March, 17th, 18th of March in Argentina, pre cryptocurrencies was pretty much on the agenda, it was a thing to be discussed, right? So before the working group was set up, we researched in the department, so who's attending, who's doing X, Y, and Z? People were afraid, like, um, well, I know a little bit, but I don't really know anything about this. So what we felt was there was probably attendance, but maybe not interaction, mm -hmm. and particularly input and output. And we wanted to change, we really wanted to change the, um, the engagement, you know, the art engagement at, those, um, at, at that level. So what have we done? We've gone and pretty much trained, I wouldn't say trained because um, clearly you guys are the experts, but we've gone and met all those um, divisions and we've done presentations, like an hour and a half presentation, answering questions, so get everybody to understand, you know, what does centralized, decentralized, what's a platform mean, what does it mean Bitcoin, what mining means, so as things are raised, as people are aware, and they can bring it back to us um, with questions. Uh, we've done things like um, the EC Observatory Forum, I think, um, uh, George, you mentioned it earlier. The first workshop uh, well, took place actually last week in Vienna, um, a working group of uh, up to 30 representatives. 
we uh, put forward candidates and we managed to, to make sure to ensure that we have Irish uh, Ireland is represented at the working group. So that's an ongoing discussion at EC level in relation to public use cases of the technology, but also regulation. Uh, myself, I was at an OECD digital assets um, workshop in Paris um, two, three weeks ago. Again, great way. Finally, we're there. Uh, people surprised that Ireland wanted to go into that. I'm like, where? Here we are. You know, where do I sit? Fantastic. Um, a lot of people, you know, coming forward wanted to to engage and continue the uh, the discussion outside. And the, the truth is, is this: is we see that pretty much everybody is in a very similar space, which is watch out and see where, we, where we're going. So, we've done quite a few things. Questions after if you want, if you, if you, if you question how much we've done in two months. Um, we've done quite a bit in two months that wasn't done, but the reality is there's a lot of work to do. And I mean a lot, and I'm looking at um, the lawyers, not so lawyers, um, who would want to, to discuss this. We're looking at uh, doing more roundtables to also with conjunction with uh, the CBI. Either we're happy to lead some of them, we're happy to participate in others. At the end of the day, without communication, it is not going to happen. We, we, we can't possibly do it. And, and why is that important? But that takes me to the policy making bit. That's the third thing I, want, the third thing I wanted to talk to you about. So, policy making. Um, I'm actually going to go to all of this and ignore this. So let's just step back from talking for a minute. Um, we talk about technology. Um, Laurie mentioned as well the lack of standards at the moment in, a, in, in blockchain, but we're moving towards there, right? Um, I like to compare blockchain or look at the perspective by looking at Wi-Fi. Yeah, you all know what Wi-Fi is, <coughs> okay? A recent um, research piece found out that up to 80% of people would uh, deem the use of Wi-Fi as a deal breaker when booking a hotel room. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, why is that important? Well, Wi-Fi happened by accident. Yeah, it was a civil servant working in 1985 in the Federal Communications Commission in the US. Himself and a couple of guys wanted to do a bit of research on a couple of the wavelengths that were called kind of garbage bands, and he wanted to use it for communications. Yeah, some his boss said, "Okay, fine, stop annoying me about it. I'll give you access to it." And he was granted the license to use that wave. So that will happen in 1985. Wi-Fi kind of started off. Yes, um, back then, anybody lived in the U.S. back then can probably say that before better than me. Wi-Fi and the underlying technology or uh, protocol was proprietary. So if you had Wi-Fi on your phone and then you had a different maker for your laptop, um, there were separate Wi-Fis, yeah? Something that we take for granted now, pretty much. From 1985 until 1997, that's 12 years. That was proprietary. It was 12 years when everybody, any maker, any technology, product maker decided to do, they were doing their own thing. There was no interoperability uh, like we've just taken for granted. Now, what happened in 1997? In 1997, regulators and industry got together and over 18 months they hashed out what they called basic principles. They're just like, basic standards of production for Wi-Fi. So for 12 years, everybody went off and did their own thing. Consumers were the ones that lost out because clearly it was a pain. You had your phone on Wi-Fi, you went at home and your provider was a different, you had to go in and change. It was painful to say the least. 12 years, 1997 to 1999, within two years after the stand those stand standardization happened, within two years, Wi-Fi was absolutely used in every home pretty much in the US. Two years versus 12. Only about three years after that, five years from the very first set of standards in the US, we had Wi-Fi homes in Ireland. Something happened in the US, we were able to do that. I like to use this because when we talk about policy, there's a bit of, we have to find the balance between the knee-jerk reaction, the call for we need to do something, we need to regulate it, and the fact that actually it's still being discovered. So what we need to do is find the framework to allow for that technology to develop and then discuss 
or to cite or tailor whatever it is in policy when the time is right, and certainly not in isolation. And I think that's what's key. Um, I think the, the case of Wi-Fi is a very good example um, of what to do with, with policy. Uh, also, in the working group, what we have very, very, very clear in our minds is that um, um, innovation and technology is not going to stick unless it's built with uh, the consumer and the users' trust and belief in it. Okay? And for that to happen, it needs, as uh, Laurie pointed out, trial and trial, and some fails, and trials again. Yes? Um, What's happened technology? Look at some of the uh, old forgotten products, you know, who still owns a VHS video recorder these days, yes? Over time has been the technology that actually has gained the consumer and the user's trust and adoption, the one that's moved forward. So maybe we're still in, maybe we're still in the process of getting to that point, and when that happens, we'll go into policy. Um, maybe just to, um, to wrap up the three things, um, the ESFAT presentation, the working group, and the policy overview. We keep talking about blockchain as a technology, uh, as an innovation piece. As you read and the more you find out, if you maybe dig up a little bit behind or beneath the technology, what you find out is that actually what's at play is a lot more fundamental than that. It's a change, a societal change. Um, you know, there's talks about the third, the fourth, call it whatever, um, people revolution. And what that means is that technology, the same way that steam engine change does, it changes um, society, it is very likely starting to feel like blockchain is doing that. And that's why this constant engagement with sector, consumers, with regulators is key because not just about a technology product, it really feels as a societal product. And that means a move from products to value systems, a move from a uh, regulatory, a rule principle maybe to a trust base. And this is something that we keep forgetting about. It's not just about regulating what we have, but about us starting to think about potentially we are in the midst of actually having a societal change as well. So, I'm sure the questions will come. Um, I'll just leave you yeah. for this to think about. Carries shells were the widely most used currencies, and that's because of the, the currency discussion. I don't know which way we're going for cryptocurrencies. I'm not saying that cryptocurrency is the way to go. We still haven't decided is it a currency, is it a payment system, or something else. We don't really know. But um, I think humans were very clever. We'll find a way of. Um, getting through, um, as long as we're bartering and uh, we're making business and we're making money, I have no, no, um, no concerns about what um, humanity will be able to, to discover and, and uh, decide what the right currency is for us in the future, whether it's digital or otherwise. Okay, just something to consider. I look forward to your questions.